how do you obscure the restlessness of desire by seeking to help others instead of being helped by them by expanding our reality to include others good morning everyone welcome once again so today's topic is about light whether you are a scientist or a philosopher or a devotee or a yogi eventually you'll begin to reason about light you'll begin to think about light a scientist thinks about the outer light all this light that we see here that comes from these light bulbs and sun and moon and all the stars and all that and it's not an exaggeration to say that many the majority of the greatest achievements of science have happened when somebody asked what is light made up of or when somebody asked how fast does light go or how many components does light have how does it move every time a scientist asked this question some fundamental new understanding came about and new discoveries were made now for the yogi this is the outer light the yogi talks about the inner light it's the light that we perceive in deep meditation and as you saw in today's reading it's a thing it, uh, it does happen uh, it's not something that somebody made up and i'll tell you more about this as i go along uh, the presence of that inner light is a wondrous experience and not just that it's a pole star that guides our spiritual evolution before i unpack this outer and inner light double click into it and see what's going on and to say that uh, those of you that are long time meditators well, you may see the light you may not see the light and we say light especially in this inner way it refers to not just light uh, that illuminates but also wisdom that too illuminates or peace that shines in the mind or any of the other aspects of which light is just one part so uh, if you don't see it you will if you do see it good for you but just think about this in the larger context so before i go into the inner light let me talk a little bit about the outer light this light that is here uh, it illuminates the job of that light is to show us something that already exists but we don't see it yet that we are not aware of it so if you are in a dark room you don't know whether the room is filled with furniture or whether the room is empty or if there is a big hole in the middle of the room then you turn on the light and suddenly you know and this knowing and light are very interrelated in fact there is no difference again going back to this a dark room is there a bunch of snakes in this room and therefore i should be afraid and run away or is there a box of chocolates in this room so i should be happy and stay back i don't know because it's dark i turn on the light and then i know that's why in all languages all cultures light and wisdom light and knowledge they go hand in hand in english we say light of wisdom light of reason we say enlightenment here on the spiritual path enlightenment means something very specific but in regular day to day speech you'd say ah that person gave an enlightened talk on how to make pizza and it just means that person knows a lot about making pizza knowledge knowledge and light always go hand in hand now let's dig a little bit deeper because the outer light is not quite as simple so say you're lying in bed and uh, you have a book in your hand and on your nightstand is a lamp you turn on the lamp and the light shines on your book and maybe some part of the page is illuminated and other part of the page is in shadow isn't it then you kind of turn around you wiggle a little bit turn around the lamp and you get both parts of the page illuminated but still the book itself casts a big shadow the outer light which shines on something can only illuminate can only reveal can only give you knowledge of the most superficial layer that 
which it is trying to illuminate itself comes in the way, casts a shadow, and obscures something else. Is that true? I mean, this is all everybody's common sense. I'm not saying anything new. I want to build up to something. And this is true for any kind of light, no matter what light that is. If it comes from the outside, then it is equal parts light and shadow. There's some, you meaning your knowledge is always incomplete. And it's the same thing. Remember, light and knowledge are the same thing. So to the extent that we try to understand big questions in life by looking at it from outside causes. Why am I unhappy? And then I'm not, but at least not this moment, but say I was. Why am I unhappy? And maybe I'd say, oh, somebody said something unfair and nasty to me. Or I'd say, I just need a teeny bit more money in order to satisfy my basic requirements and I just cannot believe how happy I'll be or oh, my health is not where it is supposed to be, and that causes me a little bit of grief. Now, all of this is true. This is outside understanding, the outside light. This is all absolutely true. But even if somebody said sweet things to me and my health was fine and I had enough money to be comfortable, chances are I'd still find something to be unhappy about. That's, that's just the nature of things. Many, many years ago, I, uh, I, I grew up in Bangalore, in India, and I didn't think of it that way at the time, but it turned out that I had led a very sheltered life. For the first uh, 22 years or so of my life, uh, my diet was very limited. I didn't think so at the time. I thought I had 10 different dishes. I just didn't know that there were a 1,000 different dishes in the world. Uh, it was fairly limited. It was rice and lentils and you know, some dairy products and so on. Uh, and then I jumped on a plane, came to Paris, and then to New York, and to Kansas City, and eventually to a city called Manhattan, Kansas. It's the geographic center of the United States. Uh, I'm not making this up. Okay, if you take the continental United States, put a stick on it, the place where it would balance would be Manhattan, Kansas. <laughs> so I came there, and everything was different. Okay. Um, the, the food was completely different. Being a vegetarian in the 90s in Manhattan, Kansas, it's a little bit of a challenge. Uh, and you had to incorporate cheese into your diet. And until then, I had had cheese about four times in my entire life. It just, back in the 90s, it just, if you were of a certain, shall we say, social status, uh, cheese just wasn't the thing that you ate. Uh, it's an unfamiliar food. Um, people talk differently. The weather was different. It was so much colder. Uh, the coffee was different. In India, you have very strong coffee, and you put a whole bunch of milk on it. Then you put a little bit of sugar, and the coffee has chicory blended in it. So the whole thing tastes different. And I came to the US. My first coffee I had was in a Greyhound bus stand in Kansas City, which is not a very refined form of coffee. Uh, uh, and it didn't get too much better than that, <laughs> to my taste. So I was very unhappy, because I didn't like this. I, uh, all the things I liked, I couldn't get it, and so on. Fast forward three years later. I had stayed in Manhattan, Kansas. I liked cheese. I had discovered pizza. And uh, you know, I, I, I began to like uh, our American style of coffee. And then I go back to India. And I was unhappy because I couldn't find cheese. I couldn't <laughs> find American coffee. <laughs> Where I'm going with this, it has something to do with the redeeming light. I'm going with this is when we invest a lot of energy into temporary likes and dislikes, we become very vulnerable to unhappiness because it can change like that. In my experience, clearly, there is nothing inherently satisfying about Indian coffee or American coffee. It just happens to be what I have chosen to like or dislike in this particular moment. So this is the, this is the problem with outer light, with outer a locus of identity if it becomes external. I, I heard it somewhere on TV last week. 
if my locus of identity becomes external, then there is equal parts light and shadow. I don't get the whole thing. Okay. Now, there is another, I don't get the whole thing because when I try to understand it, the ego, my sense of I, in the form of likes and dislikes, casts a big shadow. Whatever's coming off the ego is completely invisible to me. I, everybody else sees it, but I don't see it, right? So this is why it's so much easier to criticize others uh, instead of knowing what's going on with yourself. It's, it's the same light and shadow thing. The outer light just doesn't cut it. Now, there is another type of light. So if you looked at your cell phone, the cell phone screen is what is known as backlighting. The light comes from the inside, from the center of the phone. And therefore, the cell phone screen never has a shadow. Right? Have, you, have you noticed that? Because that's the inner light. The spiritual inner light is exactly the same, that it comes from deep within, so it's not falling on something. It's coming from inside, and therefore, as light, it doesn't cast any shadows, and as understanding or as any wisdom, it is perfect. So the, in the autobiography of a yogi, there is a, it's a really wonderful episode. It's in chapter one. Uh, Paramahansa Yogananda, who, who wrote the book famously and whose teachings we follow here, he was about eight years old, and he sat up in bed, and he was sitting in full lotus pose, and he had his eyes closed, and suddenly, he writes, that this very powerful thought came to him. And the thought was, what lies behind the darkness of closed eyes? And as soon as that thought came to him, it was, it was so powerful that it obliterated the preconception that behind closed eyes is only darkness. It just obliterated that because of the power of that thought. And immediately, like a lightning, there was a great light that dawned behind closed eyes. And he saw in front of him a panorama of mountains, great big mountains. And in those mountains were these caves. And these, in these caves were sitting radiant, saintly beings in deep meditation. And then out loud, he asks, uh, his, his mother and his sister were sitting in the next room, and they heard him asking this out loud. He says, who are you? And these radiant beings answered, we are the Himalayan yogis. And Yogananda said with great uh, longing, uh, he said, ah, I long to go to the Himalayas and become like you. And as soon as he said it, these shapes vanished. But the inner light expanded in wider and wider circles. Imagine that, that you have your eyes closed, and then you see this great big light and saintly beings, and then they vanish, and that light expands in wider and wider circles, ethereal, all-encompassing. And Yogananda writes that it expanded in wider and wider circles into infinity. And then, wondrously, Yogananda asks, he says, what is this wondrous glow? He says, and the light speaks. And he writes, the light spoke as if the clouds were muttering something, that it came from everywhere. This wondrous glow, it, the light said, I am Ishwara. Ishwara is, means Lord. Ishwara in Sanskrit literally translates to Lord, so you can think of it as, I am the Lord. I remind you of something? Uh, the, to the light said, I am Ishwara, and said, I am the light. And then after this, now this is, this is a wonderful episode, isn't it? The inner light, it is real. It comes from the inside. It casts no shadows. But then here's what happened next. Yogananda writes that the legacy of this inner light was that he knew that he had to dedicate his life to finding God. So this light not only was a phenomenon like, OK, it is bright, but it came with it some redeeming piece of wisdom. What is redemption? You know, you go to a supermarket, you redeem a coupon. Say, for this piece of paper, give me 50% discount on my box of chocolates. That's redemption. So the redeeming light is, you see the light, 
you offer yourself to it, that's your coupon and redemption, you get back a piece of wisdom that becomes the pole star that guides you. Now this is this knowledge that comes out to, to the inner light is pure, it's complete, there are no shadows of confusion here or there. Now this all sounds like uh, big esoteric things, but perhaps it might have happened to you. Have you had an experience where you are out in nature and suddenly in a moment of clarity something became clear, just like that, or you were sitting and meditating, uh, or there was a problem that uh, you had the previous night, you say, I give up, I'm just going to sleep, and either in your dream or suddenly when you wake up, the solution comes to you. This sudden, inner, complete knowing. That's the light, the light that shines from the inside. Um, it says in the Yoga Sutras, it's a very beautiful Yoga Sutra, it says, Kshinavritir abhijata seva maner grahitru grahana grahyeshu tatsta tadang janata samapatihi. And it sounds beautiful, doesn't it? What it says is that when the storm of likes and dislikes become less, chain of retair, then the mind, like the most perfect of crystals, reflects the light of the soul. How it's, it's described? Um, it's described in the Bible, in the Gospel of Matthew, when uh, Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives. And his disciples come to him and they say, what shall be the sign of thy coming? He's just given his fiery talk at the temple in Jerusalem and then he's sitting there. He says, what shall be the sign of thy coming? And he says, for as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even on to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as lightning cometh out of the east, east is here, it's, it's, um, it's symbolic of the point between the eyebrows. So the coming of Christ consciousness, the inner light, kutastha chaitanya, they're all the same thing. It comes like a flash of lightning, just like Yogananda described in the autobiography of a yogi. And shine it even on to the west, the west is the seat of the ego. Even the unilluminable ego, where from the outer light, outer reasoning, it doesn't show itself. Even that, shine it even on to the west so shall the coming of the Son of Man be, Son of Man, the Christ consciousness. You're there and suddenly it comes as a flash of intuition. That's why don't get too fixated on the term light. It could be light, intuition, wisdom, peace, any of those experiences, devotion, joy, you feel it, that's grace. Expand into it. It's a big deal. The, then, if, it's, if it happened, where was it before? Did we manufacture it? Did we turn on a switch? Where was it before? The Bhagavad Gita gives a marvelous answer to this. this is chapter 13, verse 18. It says, Jyoti shyamapi tad jyotihi hridi sarvasya vishtitam. Jyoti means light. Jyoti shyamapi tad jyotihi means the light that illuminates all the other lights. The light behind all lights, the light of lights. Hridi sarvasya vishtitam. Vishya means immanent, it's present everywhere. That's where the word Vishnu comes from. Hridi, heart, sarvasya, everybody's heart. The light of all lights is immanent, present everywhere in everybody's heart. So it doesn't get manufactured. Then why don't we see it? So the Bhagavad Gita says, just as the fire is covered by smoke, once knowledge gets shrouded by, are you ready for this, this is the punchline, once knowledge gets shrouded by desires or attachments, likes and dislikes, that's at the heart. That's why I told you the Kansas episode, it all comes down to that, is I like something, I dislike something, I arrange my life in just the exact way this creates a level of restlessness that behind closed eyes there's only darkness. Instead of Jyoti Shama Pijyotihi Hridi Sarvasya Vishthitam. The light of all lights is present in everyone's heart at all times. That's hidden because these likes and dislikes. So then the practical question, how do you get past these likes and dislikes? Well, discipline is one way, certainly. That's why uh, people practice tapasya, austerities, you say. 
I get up at 4 in the morning and I take a cold water shower when the, it's the exact opposite of what I wanted because I really hate it. But got to do it because somewhere in the Bible or the Gita or the Yoga Sutras, they say I have to do it. This is okay, but the heart finds no home in that kind of austerities. It's, it's just not natural to us. A far better way, I shouldn't say better, it's not either or, it's both and, that, that discipline, that willpower, that fiery self-control is all necessary, but that cannot be the only way, because it, it cannot endure, it will fizzle out. A far better way, so, uh, Swami Kriyananda says, the, the secret to happiness or inner light, wisdom, peace, whatever you want to call it, says, seeking to help others instead of be helped by them. I cannot tell you the number of times uh, at, here at Ananda when we are in service and uh, it happens. I teach a yoga teacher training. You're teaching yoga all day. There is no time to eat because you can't really eat and teach yoga. And if somebody said, well, Saturday you don't eat from 9 in the morning until 6 in the evening, I wouldn't like it. I'd be very suspicious of that statement. But you're in service, you're teaching, then it just goes away. You don't you don't resent it. And then you eat whatever you eat. Uh, your entire uh, schedule, your carefully arranged life is out the window, but you love it even more. You're better for it. So that's why uh, including other people's happiness in your own, this kind of life of service is one of the best ways to go back, to remove the smoke that obscures the fire of inner light because it's hidden by desires and likes and dislikes. And uh, how am I doing on time? Do I have time for a five minute story? I want to, I want to tell you a, uh, a, it's about a husband and wife pigeon. And it's all about light. Uh, and it proceeds in an odd way, but bear with me. So there was once a very long time ago, uh, there's a very bad hunter. He's a very cruel man. And his job was to catch birds and sell them in the market. And so one, one day he was hunting, he had a bag full of birds, they were making little noises because they were unhappy about being captured. And then suddenly a big storm comes. Uh, he's in the forest and the hunter is scared for his life. Uh, he begins to run desperately to seek shelter. And in the midst of his uh, run and his desperate uh, fear of his life, he sees a little pigeon. It's in a bush and the pigeon is stuck and it's shivering. Hunting is such a second nature to him that he, he pauses his uh, death run and then grabs hold of the pigeon and puts it in the basket, in the bag that has all the other birds. And the pigeon's making little noises. And then he goes into a great big tree and he says, oh, great tree, please shelter me from this rain, protect me. Now it so happens that in this tree, I say, pigeon's nest. And that happens to be the nest of this pigeon that he just captured. And this pigeon, who's the wife pigeon, her husband is in the nest. And the husband's getting desperate. And the husband's saying, oh, dear wife, where are you? Why haven't you come back? It's you know speaking in pigeon speak. Where are you? Why haven't you come back? Uh, I'm, I'm getting afraid for you. And from within the bag, uh, the wife uh, the wife pigeon speaks up and says, oh, dear husband, I'm here. I'm in the bag of this hunter who's taking shelter beneath the tree. And the wife pigeon, who's a very exalted soul, uh, she says, uh, please don't hate him for it. This is, this is karma. This is what he's here to do. And then the wife asks the husband, as wives often ask husbands, she says, did you not hear what the hunter just said? And the husband says, what? What did he say? I said, well, he, he's seeking shelter uh, in the tree. Our nest is in the tree, so he's our guest. Uh, he's shivering, so you have to take care of the guest. Why don't you do something about this? And the husband pigeon says, okay, yes, dear, I'm going to do something about it. Uh, so the husband pigeon flies off, uh, goes beyond the rain to a place, and then there is a campfire there, bring, uh, brings a little burning twig, and then drops it in front of the hunter. Um, and then goes in all other places, brings little, little twigs, and soon there is a little pile of twigs. There is a nice little crackling bonfire, and the, uh, for the cruel bad hunter with a bag of birds, including the wife pigeon, is now a little warm. And then he says out loud, oh, I'm so hungry. I wish I had something to eat. 
and then the husband pigeon doesn't know what to do, and him and his wife, he's in the bag, they have a little pigeon conversation, and then very reluctantly and with great sorrow, they come to the conclusion, there's only one thing that you can do, my dear husband. Husband says, yes, I know. And the husband flies way high up into the, uh, above the tree, and then plunges down into the fire, and just before plunging into the fire, it tells the hunter in human voice, I offer my body as food for you. I hope you're content. And it plunges into the fire. Because it had serving the guest was such a paramount dharma for these pigeons. And then in that instant, the, farmer, the, the hunter is mortified. He says, what an evil life I have led. How despicable are my acts. And his heart, all the cruelty melts from his heart and comes out as tears of remorse and he releases the bag and lets go of all the birds. And the wife pigeon comes out and now he says, my dear husband, how can I live without you? And she too is about to plunge into the fire. But from the fire comes out the bird, a pigeon, not in human form, but as pure redeeming light. The pigeon comes out and the wings of this unselfish husband pigeon touches the wings of this unselfish wife pigeon. And in that moment, the wife too becomes a beam of light. And these two pigeons fly away in the dusk, in the forest, up into the heavens as twin beams of light. So how do you see the redeeming light? How do you obscure the restlessness of desire? By seeking to help others instead of being helped by them, by expanding our reality to include others. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Amen. I was caught up in ecstasy.